What's going on guys? I'm Tyler, and to continue my series of Studio Ghibli reviews, I'm here to let you know that Tales from Earthsea is no perfect movie. Although chances are a good few of you already knew that, but nevertheless. Tales from Earthsea is about a young runaway prince named Aaron who comes across this wise wizard named Sparrowhawk, voiced by Timothy Dalton. And the two of them, along with a farmer named Tenar, played by Mariska Hargate, and her young foster daughter Teru, they decide to go out and seek out this evil wizard named Lord Cobb, played by Willem Dafoe, who is out to seek eternal life at the risk of causing imbalance within the world. Now, Tales from Earthsea is the rare Studio Ghibli movie that even the most diehard fans are incredibly disappointed with, and it's probably the one Studio Ghibli movie that was probably the hardest to make, mainly for personal reasons as opposed to, as opposed to actual production problems. Ever since the 80s, Hayao Miyazaki wanted to make an Earthsea movie, but the author of the books, Ursula K. Le Guin, had never really heard of him. She had only associated animation with Disney movies, and because of that incredibly narrow-minded process, absolutely refused. But as soon as Spirited Away won the Oscar for Best Animated Feature, she actually became a fan of his, and she felt that he was the perfect person to adapt her source material. Problem was, he was too busy with Howl's Moving Castle, and when he brought on his son, Goro Miyazaki, to be a consultant, when he showed Toshio Suzuki, the producer of the movie, his storyboards, Suzuki went, Hey, Hayo, you keep going with uh, Howl's Moving Castle. Let's let your son direct this movie. Your son, who has no, no, no prior knowledge of filmmaking, let alone in animation, and was mainly working in the landscape and architecture businesses before becoming a filmmaker, you can imagine how upset Hayao was with that. And Goro, I don't think, was super thrilled about it either in the beginning because he was very reluctant to enter the film industry. He knew for a fact that people were going to expect him to level up to Hayao's standards. And sure enough, it doesn't come as much surprise that the two of them gave each other the silent treatment as production of the movie was, was underway. Thankfully, they seem to have gotten on good terms lately, and Hayao flat out said at the premiere, you made this movie honest and you made it good, and Ursula K. Le Guin said, this isn't my book, it's your movie, and it's a good movie. And that's pretty much where the praise stops from her perspective. So it's really tricky to understand what the main consensus is of why people don't really like this movie, but as is... For the first two thirds of the movie, I thought it was a good but not great movie that was very underrated by Studio Ghibli standards. For the first two thirds anyways, but as per usual, I'm going to try and stick with the positives of the movie. Like the animation. It's Studio Ghibli. It's of course going to be of a high production value. It portrays the middle age setting very nicely in regards to the design of castles, farmhouses, all these desert wastelands where there are these massive ships that make it very clear there was an ocean at one point and nature is starting to slowly but surely fade away in this world. And it goes without saying, I mentioned that Goro Miyazaki was a landscaper, so he obviously has a certain level of love and appreciation for nature that you would come to expect with Miyazaki movies. It still has this bright and colorful aspect that you would expect from any movie by the studio. And there are so many wide shots that make very mundane city towns or these vast wastelands or very vast but still bright and beautiful fields look equally massive in scope. And you know what? Considering he was a landscaper and an architect, it really shouldn't be that big of a surprise that Goro was good at animation. In order to be in those industries, you have to be able to imagine something from someone else's perspective by studying and applying a great amount of observation so that you can show someone that you have a very clear shared perspective, like say having a drawing of what a landscape or a building is supposed to look like in regards to blueprints. So he may not have been a classically trained animator, but then again, Isao Takahata didn't even draw and look at what great movies he made. So regardless of the experience, as a directorial debut, Goro did a pretty good job. And I also got to mention the person who made the score, because I actually think this is one of the most underrated musical scores from a Ghibli movie. Let's see. Uh, Tamiya Terashima. This musical score has the Joe Hisashi level of being large scale and orchestral. 
it does a great job at introducing this level of dread whenever a central character is built up. And I love the way that every character is built up by showing them at the feet first and then slowly panning upwards to see their face. Even the smallest characters make a large impression based on the animation, the camera movements, and the music. So for the first two thirds, it definitely leaves a strong impact visually, artistically, and especially with voice acting too, because by far, the best character in this movie for sure is Sparrowhawk, who is voiced incredibly well by Timothy Dalton. His soft-spoken monotone makes him seem like such a compassionate, wise, but still strict and stern wizard, and there's a lot of his backstory that is left up to interpretation, mainly the unusual scar that he has on the right side of his face. But nevertheless, the very unique design that... I read that in the books, he's supposed to be of First Nations ancestry, and in this one, they make it clear that he's kind of half Caucasian, half uh, First Nations in regards to his character design, but also the color of his skin. Nevertheless, he's still probably the best character for sure, because even though you don't know that much about him, you know what his philosophies in life are, and he's the main He's the main character to focus on in regards to what this movie is about and how people change their perspectives from being so negative about life to being a little more uplifted to understanding that life does come with consequences, but those consequences are the reasons that we keep going forward and live each day like it's going to be our last. Mariska Hargitay as Tenar is good with the amount of time that she has, and it's nice to see Mariska Hargitay being something without stealing the spotlight. I can safely say that as an SVU fan, but it does. she does get a little annoying towards the third act where she, when she gets captured, she makes a lot of screaming where it's just like, get out of here, leave me alone. And I'm just sitting there going, you know, if you were a five-year-old kid, it would make sense why you were screaming so much, but you know what you know what this guy's dangerous lifestyle is, right? I mean, you keep hinting at this implied backstory, which is basically the plot of the second book, at least as far as I'm concerned. And we'll get more into that later. But as is, she does give a really good performance, and it's nice to, again, see her in a performance that doesn't rely on showboating. By the way, I forgot to mention that one of the most, if not the most badass things about Sparrowhawk as a character is that he still follows the Miyazaki pacifist beliefs whenever he's in combat. Since he's a wizard, he's able to incapacitate someone without really causing them bodily harm. And in order to hurt one person, if he's outnumbered, he can hurt that one guy, say, who else is next, and then they can run away. And he can safely say that he didn't have to use excessive force on people. Or if someone's trying to hunt him down, he can actually change his appearance so that he can avoid any conflict. It's a... Once again, portraying pacifism in a pretty badass way. And I'm going to try and look up these names because I don't think these two did any other voiceover works. Matt Levin as Aaron and Blair Rest... Blair Restanio? What else have these two done? In any case, these were their de debut performances, and as is, they are good debut voiceover works. Aaron is portrayed as a man of few words, and even when he does talk, there's a lot of whispering and soft, slow talking to kind of hide himself as a person, try and hide his deepest fears to everybody. But he still has trouble maintaining that, uh, that calm and composed posture because he always has this impression that someone else is trying to follow him and possibly kill him. And Teru is even more quiet and soft-spoken to the point where she only trusts two people in the world to even talk to, and that's Tenar and Sparrowhawk. And when you look at her appearance-wise, you see the scar that she has. It's obvious why it matters so much to her that she rel relies on Tenar for physical and emotional support, and it also makes sense why she's so untrustworthy to other people. But nevertheless... She still values human life more than anything, and she would be willing to risk her own in order to help others who she genuinely believes need help, especially during the climax where it's revealed that there's a lot more to her than meets the eye. And Willem Dafoe as Lord Cobb might actually be one of Studio Ghibli's creepiest villains, not just because he looks more like Marilyn Manson than an actual wizard, but... Like most of the actors in this movie, Willem Dafoe has this very soft-spoken but still maniacally evil voice that makes him 
unsettling and intense to watch. And his motivations of trying to live for as long as possible just because death is such a fearful and final thing to experience is an identifiable motivation for the first two-thirds of the movie. Hell, even Cheech Marin does some of his best straight acting in any movie that I've actually seen. I think the only, I think the closest thing to giving a legitimately dramatic performance that I've seen from him was The Golden Palace. He was good in that, but still. But anyways, even though he's playing the typical dim-witted tough guy henchman that you would expect from him in The Lion King, his voice makes him sound a lot more slimy than you would expect from him, and that's what makes him so, what makes him such a great love-to-hate character. Now, in regards to the atmosphere, whereas other medieval or period piece movies from Studio Ghibli like Nausicaa, Castle in the Sky, Princess Mononoke, they were large scale in the atmosphere and the story. Tales from Mercy is very laid back in a My Neighbor Totoro sort of way, at least for the two for first two thirds of the film. And I think that might bug some people just based on the fact that it is the Middle Ages. You need something a little bit more grand and epic, whereas in the second act of the movie, a good chunk of it is just the four main characters doing chores on a farm and sharing their personal lives. That's really about it. And I can't really safely say for the entire franchise, but having read the fourth book to Hanu, which is pretty good, I feel like it follows the atmosphere and the pacing of the original books when it comes down to it, because they focus a lot more on character interactions, and physical conflict always came second. So... Again, I can't speak for the entire franchise, but based on what I've read, it captures that part nicely, and because because it is a middle-aged setting movie, except it's more character-based, almost in a Game of Thrones or his Dark Materials types of ways, the character interactions were legitimately interesting, and the fact that they were all people of few words who were very hesitant to share each other's backstories because there's a lot of hidden pain that they feel embarrassed to admit to... That part was interesting to me for the first two thirds of the movie. And I keep saying that because even though it is minimalistic and because there is so much left up to interpretation just based on character expressions and the limited amounts of dialogue that they have, when Goro Miyazaki does try to give answers to the mystery of what is the overall lasting effect of Lord Cobb trying to seek eternal life, what that has to do with Aaron in regards to his backstories, because allegedly Aaron and Cobb have similar fears and motivations when it comes to their character arcs, which I did not buy for the rest of the movie beforehand. Everything about the story all of a sudden either becomes anticlimactic because you thought these characters were so mysterious and then their motivations were simple in the worst ways or the story itself will either become incredibly convoluted and so reliant on exposition, especially when Sparrowhawk and Cobb meet for the first time in the movie and they start sharing, do you remember what happened when you left me there? Do you remember why I left you there? Oh, you did this and this and that taught me one thing. And it's just like... That's the great thing about adapting more than one book into one movie, and I'll get to that in a second, but the thing that really did not make sense was all of the explained answers about Aaron's backstory did not feel explained, and yet they focused so much more on the overall themes and messages of the movie that were already incredibly obvious to begin with, namely of how you can't have life without death, and or how fear of death is what makes life worth living, things that Cobb and Aaron do not initially understand. And the thing that didn't make sense the most was that with Aaron, they tie in his fear of death with the first five minutes where, minor spoilers if you haven't seen the movie already, in the first five minutes, he kills his own father, steals his magic sword that he can't unsheath, and runs off. And we have absolutely no concrete answer throughout the movie why he did that. There aren't even any clear clues or possible answers as to why he did that because he flat out says he was a good man i'm not even entirely sure why i did that and there's this whole other subplot where he's being followed by someone who looks exactly like him so you think it's his evil doppelganger when in reality we were actually following the perspective of the doppelganger who's been interacting with sparrowhawk teru tenar did absolutely nothing harmful to them. If anything, even though he killed his own father and has had fights with uh, Cobb's henchmen, 
he really isn't even that bad of a person. In fact, he finds evil things repulsive, like slave trading, which is a big thing in the film. And I just sat there and I thought, how does this connect? How does this even make sense? And I tried looking it up and I found out that Goro Miyazaki deliberately left this answer open-ended so that people would come up with their own. And I appreciate that. But he also said something, and this really got me by surprise, where he said, I didn't have much relationship with my father, therefore I didn't fantasize of killing him, so this parallel does not correlate with Goro possibly wanting to kill Hayo, which I didn't realize he even needed to explain that. I knew they gave each other the silent treatment, but I didn't think it was that bad. But yeah, I look, I know that there have got to be open and clear hints or answers to all of these plot holes in the movie because Ursula K. Le Guin, the author of the books, has flat out said there are clues and open answers in the books, just not in the movie. If you're going to leave something up to interpretation, you can at least leave clues as to what it is that makes everything seem so strange and nonsensical when in reality there's something that's hidden in plain sight. And they hide some clues to it, like when when the good self talks to Teru, he doesn't have a shadow, but she does. So he's a shadow, which is a magical half of one other person. But not only do you never see the two of them get split up, so you can never put that two and two together, you never see them come back together. In fact, what even are shadows? There's so much of this that is left up to interpretation, but that is kind of the downfall. Tales from Mercy is a surprisingly good example of how leaving things up to interpretation causes more plot holes than there are subtle details. So even though I don't think it's one of Studio Ghibli's worst movies, not even close, it's just an average adult animated movie. And it's good production value, it's good animation and voice acting, and obviously well-intentioned themes and ideas can't really save the fact that it's too open-ended. It's not very often I can say that, and no doubt I'm going to have somebody saying, well, actually, there was this, this, and this. I've heard the most consistent answers being that Dark uh, Aaron wanted his father dead and the sword because he was jealous of the power or whatever, but metaphors aside, judging the story just as a story, it makes no sense. So for all those reasons, as much as I really wanted to say this was an underrated, underappreciated Ghibli movie... I am going to give Tales from Earthsea a 3 out of 5. I know that doesn't sound like that bad of a rating, but it was so good for the first two thirds. And then once they started giving answers, it either didn't make sense, it was over explained, or not explained enough all at once. It was really strange. I'm not entirely sure how my thoughts are even going to make sense to some people, but that's just how I feel in the moment. So, in any case, guys, thanks as always for watching. If you have seen Tales from Earthsea, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Let me know what your favorite book is in regards to the Earthsea um, series. And also let me know, do you think Studio Ghibli should have done a standalone Earthsea movie so that they can make more? Because why didn't they do that? You had The Cat Returns, which wasn't meant to be a feature-length movie on purpose, but they got it done once they realized that there was so much more to the story than they originally conceived, ended up being a genuine surprise. Why couldn't they do more of that? I guess we'll never know at this point, but in any case, let me know in the comments below. Be sure to stay tuned for more Studio Ghibli reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.